Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your hosts, Ken Jakes and Julie Johnson. Hi everyone, this is Ken Jakes. Uh, I'm the uh, host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at the Center for International Private Enterprise. And today, sitting in for Julie Johnson is Jenny Anderson. She is a program officer here for South Asia. And hi, how are you? Hello, I'm doing Good. well. Hi, Ken. And we have a very special guest in. He's a member of our board of directors here at SIPE, and he yeah. was also a board member going back, I guess, about 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. That's correct. But his name is Dr. Kim Holmes. He is a SIPE board member. He uh, was with the Heritage Foundation as a vice president for foreign and defense policy studies, and he took a time off there uh, from that position where he served as assistant secretary of state for international organization affairs during the George W. Bush time as president. He also is the founding editor of the famous Index of Economic Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. Kim, welcome to the program. Glad to be with you. Thanks yeah. for having me. No, it's a real pleasure for us because you bring a wealth of knowledge in and the Thank institutional you. memory that you have here at SIPE I think is really going to be insightful for, for our listeners. Uh, we were talking before the show about uh, areas of conflict and working in areas of conflict and Jenny is, is here as a co-host because she kind of runs that task force for right. here at SIPE. Uh, so we want to kind of talk about how you've evolved through the years and your thinking about uh, democracy organizations such as SITE working in, in conflict areas. Kind of walk us through the history of that. Well, in the, in the late 90s, when I was on the board the first time, uh, this was a time where we were coming off the, uh, the consequences and the aftermath of the Civil War in former Yugoslavia. And uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion at that time uh, what SIPE would do inside Serbia and other places like that. And at that time, um, I had sort of a natural skepticism about getting involved as, a, as an NGO inside conflict areas because I believed that uh, first and foremost when a society is at war uh, and there is conflict that uh, there's not a lot of space for the things that we uh, talk about its SIPE in terms of economic reform for it to develop. Well, uh, I've now been back on the, come back on the board, and in the last 15 years, uh, I, I've changed my views a bit, uh, and that is that uh, I think even though the most sort of simple case is that, well, if there is an actual war going on, you know, in places like Syria, you can't very well put a project inside the war zone. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that in places like Syria you can't prepare uh, finding uh, individuals who might be able to go back into the society after the conflict's over and help rebuild it. And also in other societies where there may be uh, so-called post-conflict societies where the fighting has stopped but they still haven't solved uh, the underlying uh, political problems that caused the war, uh, that may be precisely the time that you want to engage. Uh, because the situation is fluid, uh, new uh, alliances are being formed, new leaders are being sought after, uh, and in some ways that's probably the time where you have the greatest opportunities to influence uh, these emerging societies. Uh, so uh, that's just the, the natural evolution of where I've uh, come over the last 15 years. That's a, a great point that you make. I was just in Amman, Jordan just last week and working with uh, Yemeni uh, business leaders and something that we helped them create was a uh, economic reform transition team. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been working with them for the last several months. Of course, they're in civil war right now and they're at the negotiating table. But what we did is we helped them put together a communication strategy on how to go back home and really talk about how the private sector should be a leader in the, in the reconstruction process once, once that starts. So, you know, in communications and especially in political communications, it's all about how you define yourself and you get out in front before your opponents can define you. So it's very important for groups like that to really get out in front and explain to the public the benefits of the private sector and how they can be a leader in the reconstruction process. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. I, I think that, that is a big part of what we do here at SITE in, in terms of uh, you know preparing individuals and organizations for post-conflict uh, situations, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Um, and I think, I mean, looking bef earlier before this conversation, we were discussing, uh, Dr. Holmes, about your time with the State Department and your interaction with the UN regarding um, what we were doing in Iraq and other conflict situations. Um, 
I mean, this is sort of a jump ahead, but do you feel, I mean, the discussion that we're having about Yemen and ways to involve our, involve ourselves in post-conflict situations, do you feel that we're moving forward? Are we, are we learning some lessons from Iraq, from other places that we now are able to actually implement effectively? Well, I, I would think and hope and expect uh, that SIP is. Um, I think we're Definitely. a leader in that. I actually. think you yes. are, uh, and uh, and that's that's why you're why the organization is so very important. Because the fact of the matter is, the State Department uh, and the other federal agencies are not doing this. Uh, the military, the armed services, uh, do a fairly good job learning from best practices and learning from what they've done. Uh, the State Department is is not is not organized that way. That's not part of the culture. Uh, and frankly, neither is AID. Uh, they they have a tendency to latch on to the latest political fad that's inside the domestic political arena, and look for ways uh, in terms of serving their constituencies in Congress and elsewhere to get funding, in order to uh, replicate that and promote that. Uh, and so uh, you're you're not really you're you're sort of swimming against the, the 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 stream in terms of really trying to figure out ways to solve problems rather than just uh, carry on a political campaign. Right, definitely. And I think something that SIP does is that we take a very long-term approach. We're looking at building up institutions that, and that sort of effort takes place and over no decades. there's no quick wins when you do that. Right, exactly. Whereas there are other do donor organizations or other um, organizations around Washington or the UN, I think are looking for more sort of quick wins or something to show that they've had some effective um, products in a short amount of time, where it's difficult to measure what SIPE is doing because it takes place over many, many years. Yeah, or even before, like we're, the instance in Yemen, uh, where we're trying to set the stage for what happens after the conflict is, is exactly. been resolved. I mean, because really there's no end in sight right now. I mean, they're, they're, they're at the negotiating table, right. but we don't know how that's really going to end up. Right. Well, the way we I just want to prepare. Uh, the, the way I would think about the way the, the work that you do in SIP on, on economic reform and elsewhere and how it relates to the long-term development of democracy, the way I would look at it is is that it, it, what you're doing is trying to find the, uh, the natural constituencies, people who, uh, out of respect for their property and their desire to do business uh, and, to, and to perform commerce, uh, looking for ways in which uh, by instituting uh, the rule of law to protect them, this is the natural constituency of a mature democracy. Uh, these are not people that, uh, uh, once they develop the property and they want to protect it, they want to be represented in government, uh, and they have a stake in the society and they have a stake in stability. Uh, and the more you can spread that constituency into the lower ranks of the, uh, of the, of the society and, uh, and give them a ladder or a stepping stone to go into that in terms of opportunities, the more you will broaden that constituency. And that constituency is not only for democracy, but it's also a counter constituency to the, to the terrorists mm -hmm. and people, who, people who, want to, uh, uh, who want to find disaffected people, uh, whether it's in Egypt or other parts of the Middle East uh, where they feel like they have no hope. Uh, and like the, you know, the, the people in Tunisia that started the Arab Spring, uh, as we talked about earlier, they were vendors trying to sell their wares. Mm -hmm. And they even went to, to the point of actually burning themselves to attract right. the attention. That's what started the Arab Spring. That's what started, and that's what the Arab Spring was originally about. It got co-opted and became about other things. But there's an important insight there uh, that if you want, to, uh, you want to bring democracy to Egypt, well, it's not just about going after the regime. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, I mean, they, uh, you know, the army and else and, and other uh, oligarchs inside the society are, of course, you know, controlling the economy for their own purposes. Uh, but that's part of cronyism and corruption and the, and, and 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 the like. And that needs to be deconstructed and uh, broken apart. Uh, but at the same time, you're doing that. Uh, you need to empower individuals. Uh, through the rule of law to know that uh, that their property will be protected and and that th this is really the future of economic justice really for everybody is to have every individual uh, property and, and interest respected by the state and by the law. Kim, I want to kind of uh, 
get off track just a little bit here because one one thing about this podcast that I find it to be very interesting, especially for me, I'm an old reporter and I always have been. That's the way I think of myself. But I want to learn more about you. Uh, I want to find out, you know, how did you get to where you are today? You know, what motivated you when you were young in probably in school? You know, to what what kind of light went off in your head, thinking this is what I want to do with my life? Well, I studied history. Uh, both undergraduate and, and also at Georgetown with our PhD and a master's degree. And so I think the gateway was uh, a fascination with how not only societies evolved and changed, uh, but how they improved themselves and what, and what improve, improving themselves actually meant. Um, and there is, uh, uh, there is an, there's an old saying that, uh, that a lot of people seem to believe that history moves in one direction, in one direction only. Uh, you only need to take a photograph of how women dressed themselves in Kabul in the 1960s and compare that with today to know that that's not true. Mm. And exactly. the same can be said for Iran as yeah. well, but before, before the revolution in 79. Exactly. And, this is, uh, and this is a fascinating question to me. And I, actually, I studied Nazi Germany because I was, I was, like a lot of people, I was fascinated by this paradox of how the most, one of the, perhaps the most educated and knowledgeable society in the world could go haywire like that. Uh, the Germans have given us so much, both in engineering and philosophy and culture and music and all. How could this happen? This fascinated me. But that's part of the larger question about uh, what actually constitutes justice, uh, what constitutes freedom. Uh, we think we all know, uh, but the more I looked into it in detail and through history, the more I realized uh, that we have different answers for those questions. and uh, and. There is, uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to know what we're talking about. Where did you do your undergrad at? Uh, University of uh, Central Florida. Are you so, from that area? I was from Florida, Florida yeah. Florida? It was called Florida Tech at the time. Florida Tech. And what, what did you do right after school? What was your first job? I came straight to Georgetown to do a master's. Oh, you did? Okay. I did a master's in uh, intellectual history, history of philosophy, uh, which is where my interest in natural law and mm -hmm. those things comes from. And then my PhD was on uh, European and German history, and I spent uh, two years in uh, archives in Germany studying the rise of the Nazi party. Wow. So did you go straight to the Heritage Foundation after that? Or? No, I went to uh, the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis, uh, which was a think tank associated with the Fletcher School of Law Diplomacy for about a year and a half. Uh, and I, I decided I didn't want to study history. Uh, in, the, in the early 80s, history and social history, which was what I was doing, was so tendentious and so canned and uh, not terribly interesting. Well, but back just, then, it, you know, we, we viewed the whole world here in the West. It was an East-West thing. It was you know, right. Russia versus the United States, Soviet Union versus the United that's States, right. capitalism versus communism. So right. it was completely different now than right. what, that's right. what they Very yeah. binary. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And I was just an old-fashioned historian, you know, like I studied Leopold von Ranke, who said, <laughs> history was exactly what happened as it happened, and try to find out how it really happened, and then draw your conclusions. Well, that was not very popular because... Uh, Everyone had their preconceived philosophies, and uh, it wasn't very interesting to me, so I decided to get involved in policy. Yeah, and then uh, how did you end up working at the State Department under uh, President Bush? Uh, well, uh, after 9-11 happened, um, I, uh, I, I called over to uh, the White House personnel uh, and said, uh, you know, I feel like I need to do something to serve my country. If there's something you have for me, uh, I'd be happy to help. And, and they say, well, I'm glad you called. Uh, <laughs> you know, can you come on over where there's something to just, the very, very moment that we're trying to solve. And uh, next thing I know, they gave me the, the appointment. And what did you do there? I was assistant secretary for international organizations from uh, November 2002 to July 2005. So your portfolio was United like Nations. United Nations. It's the United Nations. I was there at the beginning of the Iraq War when we were making the bid to enter the war at the Security Council in mm -hmm. New York. Uh, my boss was Colin Powell. Mm -hmm. I was with him that day on February 5th, uh, 2003, where he gave the speech. I was sitting behind him. Wow. Um, and uh, that, was a, uh, that was a big day. There was yeah. apparently 50 million people watching. Yeah, definitely. No, it was. I remember it vividly. Yeah, I do, too. Exactly. I do, too. And then going back to the Heritage Foundation, one of the things that the Heritage Foundation is known for is the uh, Economic Freedom Index. And you were the founding editor of that. Can you kind of walk us through your thought process on putting that together? Yeah, we started in 1995. 
And uh, the, the, uh, of course, the idea of the index was not invented by me or by Heritage. It was invented by Milton Friedman and, and, uh, and Mike Walker and mm -hmm. uh, other people who were associated with the Fraser Institute and the like. Uh, they developed a, a sort of a basic methodology uh, that we, we took and we kind of modified it and we created a, uh, made it a little simpler, more user-friendly, less academic, uh, so policymakers and congressmen and others could use it. Uh, and it's been going on now since uh, 95. Uh, the Wall Street Journal came on board in the late 90s and became a co-editor. Uh, it's become quite successful, and it's one of uh, the preeminent ways of measuring economic freedom. Well, not only that, but you, in terms of branding, that, that's just, that is the Heritage Foundation. Yeah. That's the, when people think of the Heritage Foundation, they think, they think of the index. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, it's, it's quite an achievement that you had there. Um, so what are you doing today? You're on the site board. Uh -huh. um, and you're a fellow, I guess, right now at the Heritage Foundation? Yeah, I, uh, I stepped down as vice president three years ago, uh, and I'm now a, a, a senior fellow, uh, more or less an academic research. And you're teaching uh, research. Some, right? No. You're not, you're not no, teaching no, right no. now? No, I'm a research uh, analyst or research fellow in residence there, and I'm writing books. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, completed a, uh, a book going back to my uh, days of uh, intellectual history, uh, my, master's day, uh, my master's days. Uh, I've written a book, uh, uh, basically it's the intellectual history of modern liberalism uh, and uh, liberalism as progressive liberalism as we understand it today. Uh, it's called The Closing of the Liberal Mind. Uh, of course it goes back, uh, uh, it was inspired by, uh, uh, by the, the title The Closing of the American Mind uh, of a book in the 1986. Uh, but this was spe specifically looking at the, uh, at the history of liberalism and, and how it's changing. As a progressive movement? Yes. Yes, yeah. So can you kind of walk us through some of the findings that you found? And well, what we call progressivism today is, uh, uh, is not classic liberalism. Right. Uh, and it's been that way and that going in that direction for a long time, but it's accelerated over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, what what we have today uh, is uh, better described as the postmodern left. It's basically it's a it's a combination of the ideas of sort of radical egalitarianism from the new left of the 60s, in terms of uh, of identity politics and social groupings and uh, and the like, combined with the influence of the postmodern philosophers in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, which introduced the deconstruction method of relativism to... Uh, Can you give us an example of a few of those philosophers? Uh, Michel Foucault, for example, mm -hmm. the whole idea of the narrative, the meta-narrative being uh, a truth bigger than facts. This is a postmodern idea. And now it's just, it's in the popular culture. If you go to a University of Virginia mm -hmm. uh, as a reporter, you know that there's going to be some rapists in that, uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the fraternity. And then you go and you write your story, and if the facts don't match up, uh, that's the narrative. That idea was invented by these guys, uh, and it is now pretty much a signature idea of the, of the postmodern left. Uh, the idea also that um, uh, freedom and equality is defined by groups, not by individuals. Uh, and finally, the idea that there is something inherently wrong with Western culture. Uh, and everything associated with it, from the free market to the idea of individual rights, it's all a fraud. Uh, it's all a sham, uh, and uh, there's some deeper reality there that only they, the postmodern philosopher or critic, really fully understands. And um, and then it's manifested itself in multiculturalism, uh, identity, politi identity mm -hmm. politics, political correctness. You know all these things, mm -hmm. but it, the point, my point was is Microaggression that, is a new one yeah, now. That this all I'm started... That, I just found out about that. Just yeah. Can you believe that? I must be getting old. Safe spaces, <laughs> speech codes. Safe spaces, yeah. Speech codes. Uh, it's all about control of power, not freedom of, uh, of ideas. And uh, this is... Um, uh, my main point is, and that's why I use the closing of the liberal mind, is, is that... Uh, it's not really liberal anymore. Mm -hmm. It's become uh, something quite open to authoritarian uh, right. ways of looking at mm -hmm. things. And uh, and although in the long history of the left, going back to you know the French Revolution and, and and even to Marxism and the like, there's nothing new about saying that the hard left is authoritarian. Uh, but 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 the progressives had kept their distance from that for most of their history. 
by having a decent respect for the classic liberal tradition of individual rights that came from the founding fathers. Even though they disagree with it, in some ways they did not go so far as the Marxists did in Europe. Uh, and my, my, hist my point is, is that that started breaking down, that barrier started breaking down in the 60s with the rise of the new left, and now there is no light between them. So that's really, in your opinion, when it, this started? This yes. Movie. Yeah. It started in the 60s, but accelerated under the postmodernists in the 70s. What was the real, real trigger for that? Was it a lot of the social upheaval of the 60s? Yes. That uh, the, the, the gateway was the social upheaval of the baby boomers in the Vietnam War, of course. Uh, that was what gave the opening for it. Uh, but uh, intellectually, uh, it goes deeper than that. Uh, it actually goes back to uh, the crisis of confidence that uh, national liberals had in the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, where the intellectual class uh, in, in America and in Europe, uh, for a very short period of time, prior pre World War II, the 1930s, prior to World War II, mm -hmm. for a very short period of time, uh, many of the intellectuals, intellectuals in New York became communists, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was during the depths of the Depression. And then FDR came in, and then they started waning. Uh, uh, but that's where the, the the original break was. But that was a very small number of people up in New York, mm -hmm. and and people. So it really didn't take hold. No, it did not take hold because FDR and uh, and Truman and even uh, even uh, Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy, they supplanted that. Mm -hmm. That became the face of liberalism in, uh, all the way up until around 1963 and 64. Mm -hmm. and then, then with the rise of the student movement and the Berkeley free speech movement, the new generation came in, and then ideas of cultural revolution, sort of neo-Marxist ideas from the Frankfurt School, of uh, where they were combining uh, cultural revolution with the sexual revolution. This is Marcuse's whole thing mm -hmm. about eros and civilization, that the way you really get at the man was to be sexually liberated. I mean, this, and it landed right in the middle of the baby boomers getting <laughs> of a certain age. So it just, it was a, and historically, it could not have happened at a better time. When did you see hmm. a lot of this starting to seep into the Democratic Party? Uh, was it was as early as 68? McGovern. McGovern in McGovern 68. was the first time. Yeah. Uh, and then and the interesting thing is, is that that's where it first, sep uh, first surfaced. And it actually it lived on at Jimmy Carter in more ways than many people thought. But and you wouldn't normally think that. Well, that's what all people thought that Jimmy Carter was conservative because he was from Georgia, and right. he was. He did govern. And a Southern Baptist. And he did right. govern that way. Mm -hmm. But that's but that's not many of the people who worked for him were open to this new way of progressivism, and uh, and look at Jimmy Carter today. He's perfectly in sync with it. Uh, but it all went underground because it was a reaction under Reagan against this. Uh, it started in the late 70s uh, as a reaction to Carter, had been discredited, and then through the Reagan, Bush one, and uh, even the Clinton years, we were living in an era, the Reagan and the post-Reagan era, where all these excesses of the 60s had been looked down on. Now, with Barack Obama, they're back full-fledged. And uh, not only that, they're being carried on by a new generation of millennials and others who think that they came up with the idea. Well, even... Uh Clinton came in, and I forgot the, the name of the group. It was a uh, kind of reaction to this within the Democratic Party to, to bring the, the party. It was a Progressive Policy Institute. Well, that, and the, what was the other and the one? And the, the New Democrats. That, uh, from, Star, I think his name was From. It's a Progressive Policy Institute. Is that Institute. what it is? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. Al Gore and, and, and uh, a lot yeah. of Southern Democrats. But that was the post Reagan era. Right. And they right. were making, uh, you know, the Clinton said that the era of big government is over. Uh, he's not saying that now, and neither is his wife. Uh, they're doubling down on the old-style religion uh, of, of social democracy, but what's new is the postmodern cultural identity politics, which did not exist in the 1990s nearly as much as it exists now. Uh, and that's the face of the Democratic Party, and it's a face of progressivism. And uh, what I'm trying to show in my book is it's not just about people and politics, but it's also about the nature of ideas. And if the ideas that these people are now now believe are uh, in terms of their pedigree, where they came from, what they have meant when they were implemented in history has not ended up being liberal. It has been it ended up uh, very often uh, in authoritarian in authoritarianism of some kind or another. And just because it has some examples of that. Uh, well, the idea of absolute equality, mm -hmm. which goes all the way back to Spinoza, Rousseau, and the French Revolution, mm -hmm. not the American one. Mm -hmm. But the French one has been around for a very long time, that you could level society and eliminate all differences uh, through the power of the state. So it's a very, very old idea. 
But that's, uh, that, the power of that idea today is not in economics. Uh, we, we live in an advanced welfare state in this country where, uh, notwithstanding Bernie Sanders, someone like Hillary Clinton basically just wants to manage the welfare state. She's not a socialist in that sense. But when it comes to identity politics and what happens in the area of culture, there's no holes barred on where they want to go with that. And that is, that is the new wedge. And, and, and the reason why it is so, uh, it, it's so potentially a problem is because like most things that happen in politics, if it has a happy face and if it seems to be about good things, there's no natural limit on how far you can go to implement it. And so uh, a classic liberal will look at, for ex would look at gay rights, for example, as this is the way a classic liberal would look at it, is that, well, uh, all individuals are equal and they're equally free. Uh, the state and the law should not discriminate against them, mm -hmm. and they should not allow other individuals to discriminate against them. And that's the end of it. That's the end of it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the law exists. But that's not the way uh, identity politics, both in race and in gender, they take it much further than that. They say that there must be a new order where people who disagree with that are punished. Mm -hmm. And you see, uh, all done in the name of being in favor of equality. But uh, and at the end of the day, uh, the classic liberal idea of equality is that we are all the same in our common humanity. The progressive postmodern idea is that we are all the same in our differences. And we must celebrate our differences and create a new system of law that will go in and ensure that no matter how different we are, we will be treated in certain circumstances the same. And there is no law that I know of that can do that without abusing the law because it basically it goes against the idea of everybody being equal. Uh, because you're equal, equal before the law because, you know, you may be a woman, I may be a man, but we go before the court and it doesn't recognize the difference. Mm -hmm. But if you go before a court that's based upon the idea of identity politics, is it does recognize a difference mm -hmm. because it recognizes you as being part of a, a oppressed minority, I'm an, a, a part of the oppressed majority, and we must adjudicate the differences of justice on that basis. What are some of the things in your book uh, that you would describe as countering uh, this movement? Uh, I mm -hmm. try to appeal to uh, the classic liberal that's left in the progressive. Uh, and I, I say to them, uh, progressivism, as, as it evolved, uh, certainly up into the 60s, it's part of the American tradition, mm -hmm. and it must be accepted. Which includes uh, uh, libertarianism. And, yes, yeah. absolutely. Which, which is also part of the Republican Party traditionally. Yeah. Well, I have a chapter on libertarianism as a philosophy. It's not the same thing as classic liberal, but I could right, probably, right. Yeah, I could probably there, get bogged down some, here. Ex exactly, <laughs> which, which is fine with me. Yeah. This is why I like doing this podcast. Yeah. Right. But, but, uh, but there is somewhat of a difference. Some, uh, we drew talk about. But I, the answer to your question is is that uh, I, I think that there, I know of many progressives that are uncomfortable with what's, ha what's happening in the universities. Mm -hmm. The universities are supposed to be places of open discourse. They are becoming one of the most authoritarian places you can imagine, mm -hmm. where uh, the whole idea of liberal education is being completely subverted. Uh, it's not about discourse. It's not about critical thinking. It's about learning. Uh, it's about changing society. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, in a certain direction, that's pretty much the calling of a lot of people uh, outside the sciences uh, and outside. Well, Kim, when you and I were at Georgetown, I came to Georgetown just a little bit later, but it was all about learning how to learn. Yeah, back right. then, and that that's what that's what university education was all about. So that's it, right. It, it's changed evidently. So well, it's because the whole idea of criticism has been subverted. Right. Criticism back then was supposed to be learning how to learn so you can make up your own mind. Right, absolutely. Right. Critical theory now is is that some professor will come up with the, what the answer is and tell you what it is, and if you don't accept it, uh, you're outside the norm. You're, you're and, outside the norm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you'll because be, they did all the critical thinking for you. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't look good. No. Well, no we, <laughs> we have to start over again. Uh, I mean, the education system has to be really. Uh, uh, rethought, uh, particularly at the advanced level. Yeah. Uh, do you see any signs? Is there, um, from this perspective, is there any, sort? Are there any glimmers of hope? Are there any sort of institutions or people or um, philosophers who are around today that are starting to plant new ideas? To, do you see any sort of change coming? Well, uh, there are a lot of. A lot of policy analysts, a lot of philosophers, a lot of academics who individually. Uh, are very respected people, very intelligent people who, if you were to sit them down in their own world uh, and their own field, uh, would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But there's no coordinated way yet of, 
of, mm -hmm. of, of creating both a method of criticism, a, a basis of philosophy, and thirdly, a vision of the civil government based upon and related to those two things in a way that's compatible with the American tradition. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's where uh, no one is doing that. Uh, and is there any voices from the the, 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 the classic liberals? The problem is school of thought. The, the problem with the classic liberals is many of them are libertarians. Uh huh. The, and, which gets back to my point while yeah, ago. And they kind of and uh, yeah, I, I mean, right. you know if you're if you're an economist like uh, Hayek or or a Friedman or something like someone like that, then it's perfectly acceptable to call them both a libertarian and a classic liberal. Uh, but if you are a libertarian out of the anarchist tradition mm -hmm. or uh, out of the tradition of, uh, of, uh, of challenging American military power or, or uh, becoming more doctrinaire, uh, the intellectual roots of that movement at the time in the 19th century were on the left, they weren't on the right. And what makes libertarians right, rightists if you will, is their view on economics. And so it's a bit of a hodgepodge. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only, if you're going to be a classic liberal, you have to be so constitutionally, ph philosophically, uh, and also in tune with the American tradition. And uh, frankly, the American tradition is not libertarian, uh, even the founding one. It's, there, are, there are elements of classic liberalism in Absolutely, there, yeah. but it's not the same thing. Uh, someone like Madison and, uh, uh, and Hamilton and others, uh, there's no way you could describe them as libertarians. No, uh, and they were very distrustful of human nature. Uh, well, Jefferson, for example, I mean, he was very, very skeptical of the average American yes. being able to vote, even. So, so uh, was Voltaire, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, it's very yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, well, thanks so much for coming by. It's fascinating. I, yeah, I, I'm thank get you. This, this is a, exactly. This is a fascinating conversation. Well, it really is. Thank you for having yeah. me. It's, it's great talking yeah, and to you. And really glad you're back on the board. Uh, yeah. Thank and, you. And hopefully, it'll be a long stay. Thank you. Definitely. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at site.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.